What's up, brothers and sisters? This is your brother G World 7 score D. I'm going to show you this book. I'm going to talk about this book. Black Slave Owner. Black Slave Owners. Free Black Slave Masters in South Carolina, 1790 to 1860. All right. Let's, let's read some things out of this book. All right. Let's read some things out of this book. All right. We'll get the light. <laughs> read some things out of this book. All right. Turn the pages here, and I'm going to read. I'm going to go to chapter. Let's try chapter six, the Woodson thesis, fact or fiction. I'm on chapter six, okay. and we're going to turn to chapter six. All right. Here we go, right here. Many historians have argued that the majority of black masters purchased their relatives and friends who were held in bondage. Being unable to manumit their loved ones, the black masters were forced to hold their kinfolks and friends as nominal slaves. So they treated their relatives and friends as free persons. And whenever possible, they attempted to manumit their loved ones. Thus the d dominant pattern of slaveholding that developed among free blacks was benevolent, and based primarily on kinship. The chief architect of the benevolent interpretation was Carter G. Woodson, and his thesis had been accepted by most historians. Yet the Woodson thesis has many weaknesses that have been overlooked or not fully explored by its supporters. Furthermore, the Woodson thesis has been overemphasized. While the other side of the free black slave owning has been characterized as a minor facet by many scholars. However, there is ample evidence which demonstrates that free blacks purchased slaves as capital investments. To many black masters, slave represented value property being used to produce more wealth. These slave owners, therefore, bought slaves and commercial assets and used them to make a profit. In fact, the commercial side of free black slaveholding was more prevalent than previously man maintained by historians. In short, the Woodson thesis that most free black slave owners were benevolent masters may be a myth. The benevolent interpretation postulated by Carter G. Woodson was based on data collected from the federal census of 1830. According to Woodson, the census provides ample proof of free Negroes owning family members. He declared in 1924 that the census records show that the majority of Negro owners of slaves were such from the point of philanthropy. In many instances, the husband purchased his wife or vice versa. The slaves belonging to such families were few compared with the large numbers found among the whites on well-developed plantations. Slaves of Negroes, in some cases, the children of a free father who had purchased his wife. If he did not thereafter emancipate the mother, as so many such husbands failed to do, his own children were born his slaves and were thus reported to the enumerators. Benevolent Negroes often purchased slaves to make their lot easier by granting them their freedom for a nominal sum or by permitting them to work it out on liberal terms. In essence, Woodson's argument is centered upon three major points, all derived from the census of 1830. First, the majority of free blacks purchased relatives and friends who were slaves to white owners, and then allowed them a greater degree of freedom. Second, the small number of slaves held by black masters, when compared to the large number of slaves owned by white planters, suggests that free blacks purchased family members. Third, the census demonstrates these two excuse me, these first two points proving that free black slave owners were benevolent or philanthropic. Philanthropic. Many scholars in the historical community have a question to the Woodson thesis and have argued that most free black masters were benevolent slave owners. In fact, John Ho Franklin reiterated, reiterated the benevolent interpretation. The majority of Negro owners of slaves had some personal interest in their property. 
Frequently, the husband purchased his wife a vice or versa, or the slaves were the children of a free father who had purchased his wife, or they were other relatives or friends who had been rescued from the worst features of the institution by some affluent free Negroes. The assertions of John Ho Franklin were quite typical amongst many prominent historians. Ira, Ira Berlin also accepted the benevolent interpretation, asserting that Although most free Negro slaveholders were truly benevolent despots, owning only their families and friends to prevent their enslavement or forcible deportation, a small minority of wealthy freemen exploited slaves for commercial purposes. Many historians, like John Ho Franklin and Ira Berlin, have accepted the Woodson thesis. Even at this writing, they continue to maintain that most black masters were benevolent slave owners and had relatives to rescue them from the chains of slavery. Yet a small group of scholars had questioned the benevolent premises of Carter G. Woodson. In 1942, Luther P. Jackson reiterated the Woodson thesis that free black masses were primarily benevolent, but he also asserted that after 1850, the institution became more commercial, with free blacks becoming, excuse me, free blacks beginning to purchase more and more slaves as capital investment. According to Jackson, black entrepreneurs who purchased slaves to work in their businesses were pre prevalent in the 1850s. These black capitalists worked as barbers, carpenters, and farmers, as well as in other occupations which demanded laborers. Recognizing that slaves could be used to produce more wealth, these entrepreneurs utilized slaves as commercial assets and purchased them and sold them to make a profit. The assertions of Luther P. Jackson slightly modified Woodson's thesis. Both hypotheses accepted the benevolent motives of black masters as the dominant force at one point in the development of black slave owning. However, Jackson maintained that the commercial side of the institution was more prevalent after 1850. The observation of Jackson had been shared and even extended by other historians. In 1976, the benevolent premise was eloquently questioned by a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. David Rackin said that historians have traditionally assigned noble and genuine uh, genuous motives to colored slave owners. They have argued that the great majority of Negro masters own relatives, and in New Orleans conveyance records provide ample evidence of fathers and mothers buying their offspring. They have argued that the small size of Negro slaveholding supports the picture of the paternal masters. If many free colors brought slaves for their own good, others sold them for a profit. For example, on April 15, 1862, just 10 days before Union forces captured New Orleans, a free woman of color sold a 25-year-old female slave to Daniel Edwards. Other free colors sold troublesome slaves or returned them to the original owner for cash. <laughs> Rankin's observation concerning the commercial aspects of free black slave owning were quite correct. Yet the commercial transaction of free blacks were also conducted by so-called benevolent slaveholders. A careful examination of the three major premises stated by Carter G. Woodson cast suspicion upon the validity of the benevolent interpretation. For example, Woodson asserted that the majority of free blacks who own slaves purchase only relatives and friends to allow them a greater degree of freedom. But he did not consider that many persons of color brought slaves to be used as investment even while they maintained and protected their slave families and friends. In Charleston, Neck, in Charleston, excuse me, Neck, James Brown, a free mulatto and a butcher, bought his wife Nancy, who later gave birth to their two sons, John and James Brown. While she was a slave, since Brown could not manumit his family, he was forced to hold his loved ones as nominal slaves and give them their liberties. Yet James Brown also purchased slaves who were not related to him by kingship but acquire as an investment for himself and his family. In 18, 
21, for example, he bought a Negro boy named Joe from Levi Moses, the slave trader of Charleston City, for 250 He later purchased from Moses a black woman named Juliet and her three children named Lucy, George, and Juliet for 800 Brown bought these slaves to assist him in the maintenance of his butcher shop as well as to provide domestic services for his family. Since Brown owned two sets of slaves, he undoubtedly treated them differently. Even though his two slave sons were his property, he treated them as though they had been born free from slavery. But the slaves purchased for their labor was considered more chattel to be bought and sold. A deed of trust established between James Brown and two colored friends demonstrates his interaction with his two sets of slaves. In the trust, he stated that, in consideration of the natural love and affection which he, the said James Brown, hath for his two slaves, John Brown and James Brown, and for the purposes of making some provisions for them after his death, and also of the sum of one dollar to him, paid by the said John Weston and R. E. Dreesreef, half given and granted, untold them, and the following Negro slaves, that is to say, Joe, age about ten years, Juliet, age about six years, Lucy, age about nine years, and George, age about seven years. In trust, nevertheless, for the sole use benefit in behalf of him, the said James Brown. At his death, should his son, excuse me, after his death, should has said sons John Brown and James Brown be alive to have and to hold the said Negro slave. <clears throat> In the deed of trust, James Brown transferred the legal title to all of his slaves except Juliet, the mother of the slave children, to John Weston and Richard E. Deeriff for the future benefit of his two slave sons. In the meantime, Juliet continued to serve the domestic needs of the colored family until the death of James Brown in 1842. In the inventory of the deceased man, Juliet was listed as an old serving Negro woman and valued at $50. The slave ownership of James Brown then demonstrated a benevolent as well as a commercial exchange. In many other instances, free blacks who purchased their families purchased other slaves for investment purposes to benefit their loved ones. In 1828, William Tardiff, a free mulatto and a boat builder of Charleston, Neck, purchased his daughter, Catty, and her children, Hester and Joe, from Benjamin F. Scott and J.G. Jenkins, executors of the estate of the deceased B. Reynolds, for $780. He also owned other slaves to utilize their labor. However, his interaction with his daughter was primarily a father-daughter relationship, while he treated his slave workers as chattel. In May 1835, he wrote, I leave my daughter Katie and her present and future issue an increase to the care and protection of the free portion of my family to hold them in the same manner as I have myself here thereto held her. It is further my will that if my other slaves shall desire to be sold or if the sale of them be deemed expedient for the good of my estate, May my executors shall have full power and authority to dispose to them to the best advantage. In the early part of June 1835, William Tardiff died, leaving the estate value at $4,607.79. Among the property that he owed, owned were five slaves. His human chattel consisted of a male boat builder valued at 600 and a female slave named Betty and her three children, who were appraised at $1,000. Yet neither his daughter nor his grandchildren were listed in the inventory. Clearly, William Tardiff, as well as his executors, made a distinction between the enslaved relatives and the other slaves. In 1839, 
The daughter and granddaughter of William Tardif were reported in the Free Negro Capitalization of Tax Book. However, they were listed as slaves. Undoubtedly, the widow of William Tardif considered her dependents free persons, but the city tax collector apparently knew that they were slaves. When Carter G. Wilson asserted that free blacks purchased slave relatives and friends, he was quite correct. However, free blacks who held loved ones brought, bought other slaves to be exploited for profit. To classify these transactions as benevolent would be a mistake. Even though these slave owners usually demonstrate benevolent behavior towards their slave relations and friends, a commercial or materialistic exchange existed between them and their slave purchased as investments. In fact, the free blacks who maintain a dual relationship with their slaves had no universal commitment against slavery. To them, slavery was an oppressive institution when it affected a beloved relative or a trusted friend. But beyond that rim, slavery was viewed as a profit-making institution to be exploited. In many instances, free black slaveholders shared a similar view of slavery with their white counterparts. Slave owners of both races occasionally uh, manumitted a trusted servant and in the same moment requested the sale of another slave. The act of freeing one or several slaves while others remained in bondage did not constitute a firm commitment against slavery, but a personal view which acknowledged that some slaves, through merit or hard work, deserved their freedom, while others were destined to be slaves and to death. So when uh, philanthropic, philanthropic free blacks purchased slaves and then emancipated them, they were not always um, paternalistic owners, as Carter G. Wilson suggested. For example, Richard Holloway, Sr., a free black Charleston city, brought a slave named Charles Benford in order that the slave might enjoy freedom. Yet at the same time, he owned other slaves who were not treated so kindly. In 1834, for instance, he purchased a Negro woman named Sarah and her two children, Annette and Edward, from Susan B. Robertson for $570. Within three years after the purchase, he apparently became dissatisfied with the slave family and sold them for $945. When Holloway sold the, um, sold the slave family, he made a profit of $370. Even though Richard Holloway Sr. allowed a trusted servant to enjoy a greater degree of freedom, he was still a slave owner for profit. So he sold and purchased slave as an investment, even while he held other slaves for benevolent reasons. To consider him a benevolent master would be erroneous because he also exploited other slaves for his own benefit. Another example of the dual interaction between black masters and their slaves is the case of Rose Summers. In her will, she stated, I give and bequeath unto my executor, within name two children my slaves, one named John and the other infant named Polly, being the children of my slave named Bella, but under express and positive conditions that he may said executor will emancipate and set free above named two children. I desire, as soon as it may be predictable, that my executor herein named will sell for money my four slaves to the best possible advantage together with all my household furniture. Man, he reached the right funny back in the day, man. <laughs> While Summers requested that the children of her trusted servant Bella should be emancipated, her other slaves were doomed to the auction block. In December 1840, her executor sold to slave woman Elsa. Then the slaves Sam and Henry were auctioned to the highest bidder for $970.13 in January 1841. Shortly after, shortly after that date, the slave woman named Harriet was sold by the executor of Rose Summers for $200. After the sale of the Negro slaves and the furniture, the estate of Rose Summers netted $1,334.79, which was divided among five colored women designated as hares,
by the deceased woman. All right. Clearly, Carter G. Woodson was particularly correct when he said that benevolent Negroes often purchase slaves to make their lot easier by granting them their freedom. Yet these same Negroes also own slaves who are purchased as laborers and used as investment. Even as they free trusted servants, many black masters had no intentions of emancipating their other slaves, even when the masters died and could not benefit from their investment. So when Carter G. Wilson declared that the majority of Negro owners of slaves were such from the point of view of philanthropy, philanthropy he failed to consider that there were so-called benevolent masters who freed one slave and sold another slave for profit. Woodson's perception of free black slaveholding was partially correct. However, when the totality of the institution examined, his assumptions are revealed to be erroneous. Carter G. Woodson underestimated the materialistic side of black slaveholding when he said that the majority of free blacks owned slaves for benevolent reasons. Many black masters were firmly committed to chattel slavery and saw no reason for manumitting their slaves. To those color masters, slaves were merely property to be purchased, sold, or exchanged. Their economic self-interest overrode whatever moral concerns or guilt they may have harbored about slavery. Since the black master benefited from slavery, they rationalized that because the institution was profitable. They could not relinquish their valuable property without being reimbursed, so black masters continued to own slaves even when the Union Army was preparing to invade South Carolina in 1864. Throughout the antebellum period in South Carolina, the, material, the materialistic side of black slaveholding was recorded in hundreds of individual documents. In the Office of the Secretary of State, free blacks registered numerous bills of sales which involved the purchasing of slaves. For example, January Hines, a free black of Charleston City, recorded the purchase of Negro women named Kathy for 35 pounds sterling in 1800. A few years later, Marianne Smith, a colored woman of Charleston City, registered the purchase of a bricklayer named Stephen from Elza Troop for 550. Although free blacks purchased relatives and friends who were slaves, others undoubtedly acquired slaves for commercial purposes. In 1833, Albert Smith purchased a black woman named Suzette for $305. Apparently, Smith became dissatisfied with the slave, and two years later, he sold the woman to Michael Castellon for $305. When black masters sold slaves at the market value, the transactions were usually for far from being benevolent in implied commercial uses. In spite of Carl G. Woodson's assertions that black slaveholding was primarily benevolent and based on kinship, the sale of slaves were prevalent among free black masters. In Charleston City, for example, William Johnson, a free black, a free black and a carpenter, recorded the sale of a Negro boy named Ben. In 1781, the slave boy was sold to Conrad Kinkley for 1,000 pounds sterling. Seven years later, James and Hannah Miles sold a Negro woman named Lucy to Richard Savage for 35 pounds sterling. And in 1801, the sale of a woman Charlotte was registered by John Martin Logan, who was a color carpenter for Charleston City. Surely the slave dealings of these black owners, slave owners, were act of commerce for monetary return. The commercial impulse of black mass to exploit the commonality of slave property was recorded not only by the Secretary of State, but the master of equity in Charleston District. In scores of report, the black masters appeared to have used their slaves as commodities. On June 2, 1838, for example, two colored women were involved in litigation over the ownership of a slave named Joe. In that year, Patience McKenzie filed a suit against Elza Mackey. She claimed that her male slave was unlawfully seized by Elza Mackey and placed in the city workhouse, as well as declaring ownership of the slave. She maintained that the Negro man was her husband. Patience McKenzie asserted that Joe belonged to her 
because she had fulfilled the last financial payment to Elza Mackey, who loaned her the money to purchase a slave in 1832. However, when she made her final payment, the color creditor declared that the money was merely the wages for the labor of the slave. Accordingly to the testimony of Elza Mackey, the slave was purchased by her and only hired out at Patient McKenzie. In sworn testimony, Elza Mackey said that Joe was purchased by herself from William A. Carlson, 1837. Shortly thereafter, she hired him to Patient McKenzie, who paid her wages for the labor of Joe until March 1838. When a color hire refers to pay the fee for using the slave, then Mackey placed the slave in the workhouse and demanded that the master of the workhouse release the slave only on her authority. Regardless of whether Patience McKenzie or Elza Mackey owned the slave, the commercial impulses of Mackey are quite apparent. All right? And, you know, this goes down to break down how you have black people who own slaves. And they um, made a profit off of them, man. And I mentioned this before at the talking about Jay Rogers' book, how you had black slave owners. And they made a big time profit off of other blacks. And this is before the Civil War. You know, or quite quite some years before the Civil War. Alright, so this is some information that you can pull and then look into. And I just read a, a little bit um from this book. Black slave owners, free black slave masters in South Carolina from 1790 to 1860. From 1790 to 1860. This is a pretty good book. And I think you should you know, get it and, and read and study from it. And there's other books that talks about this. You know, Talk about this very issue of blacks owned slaves. But I, I mentioned before states that we really had black slave owners like Louisiana and then South Carolina. Yeah, black, yeah, and other states too, but those states really, really particularly, you have black slave owners. Wealthy blacks who own other blacks as slaves. Not all of them were so-called mulattoes. Some of them were just some dark-skinned niggers with money. You know, so we have to understand that you have black people who own slaves. You know. And here, here's another thing from the book I want to mention real quick. Among the well-to-do color families, the ownership of slaves was often passed from parent to child. Many colored families were aware of the financial benefits of slavery, and so they provided their children with slaves to further their ambitions. In 1835, Miss Barbara Barquit of Charleston City sold a Negro man named Peter, who was 20 years old, to her daughter Margaret C. Humphreys for the nominal sum of $1. Miss Barquit sold hope that the male slave would be a great assistance to her son-in-law, Joseph Pencil Humphreys, who was a tailor. Prior to the nominal sale, Joseph and Margaret C. Humphreys owned only three slaves, who were all under 10 years old and able to be utilized as laborers by the colored couple. With the acquisition of the 20-year-old male slave, Joseph P. Humphreys acquired a laborer to be employed in his tailor shop on 112 Queen Street. By 1840, the couple owned four laborers who were between 10 and 24 years old. Damn. <laughs> Damn, brothers and sisters, man. This is a pretty good book. And it also has records of these niggas uh, <laughs> on slaves, man. You know, these little niggas. So it's, this is something that you need to look into. This is a good book, man. Black Slave Owners. Free black slave masters in South Carolina from 1790 to 1860. Check the book out, man. This is another rendition by the brother G World. That's me. <laughs> brother G World, I'm dropping another one. This is another um, video I'm doing, and I just wanted to talk about that today to let you know that you have black slave owners. Peace and love.